Welcome back, everyone. Thank you for joining our online stream this week. We'd love to have you tune in every single week on our service. I know it's been online for quite some time now, and we are eager to come together once again in church as the body of Christ and see your faces, see your smiles here sitting in the rows. But until that time, we're happy that you've joined, and I ask you that you please, for the next hour or so, take the time to really put all of your attention onto the service. You open up your Bibles, you worship wherever you are sitting at home, and really tune into the message this week. So I'd like to open up this service by saying a quick prayer, and then we'll begin. Dear Lord God, we thank you for all your mercies and grace that you extend to us even through this time of quarantine, Lord God. We are so eager and we long to have fellowship with each other and with you, but we are thankful for all the means that we can still connect via social media, YouTube, other apps that you allow us to still connect. Lord God, I ask that you will allow um, this coronavirus to pass and that our people may come once again together and enjoy your presence through each other. Lord God, I ask that you bless this service and this worship, that we may glorify your names at, at home, wherever we are, and that we ask this in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Good morning, church. What a joy it is to come into the presence of our Lord and Savior to worship and glorify his holy name. And I want to just invite you to sing praises with us as we sing of his great mercy. What love could remember No wrongs we have done Omniscient, all-knowing He counts not their sum Thrown into a sea Without bottom or shore since they are many, His mercy is more. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more. Stronger than darkness, new every morn. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. would wait as we constantly grow. What Father so tender is calling us home. He welcomes the weakest, the vilest, the poor. Our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. Praise the Lord. His mercy the payment, his life was the cost. We stood neath the dead we could never afford. Our sins, they are many, his mercy is more. Praise the Lord, his mercy is more. His mercy is more, stronger than darkness, new every morn. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is Thank you. 
low, vast as the ocean, loving kindness as the flood. When the prince of life our ransom shed for us his precious blood, who is love will not remember, who can cease to sing his praise, he will never be forgotten throughout heaven's eternal day. Fountains open deep and wide Through the floodgates of God's mercy Float a vast and gracious tide Grace and love like mighty rivers Pour descending from above And heaven's peace and perfect justice direct me by thy spirit through thy word and thy grace my need is meeting as I trust in thee my Lord of thy fullness thou art pouring thy great love and power on me without man Fool and boundless, drawing out my heart to thee. Of thy fullness, thou art pouring thy great love and power on me. Without measure, fool and boundless, drawing out. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so, so much for your love for us, Lord, for it is immeasurable. We cannot comprehend your love for us. God, in your vast, glorious strength and power, you thought of us and sent your son, Jesus Christ, to this earth to live the perfect life, the life that we should have lived. And you bore our sins on that cross on Calvary and you bore the wrath that was deserved for us, Lord. And you took our place, God. We thank you so much for your grace and love for us, Lord. We cannot, we cannot even imagine and comprehend what great love you have for us, Lord. And you just continue to bless us and bless us every single day, every minute, every second, Lord. We thank you for your grace, God. We just want to praise you for all that you have done for us and everything that you continue to bless us with, Lord. In your name we pray, amen. Welcome again to our English speaking service. It's a joy to connect even through online means, but at least something we can still keep in touch. And I pray and I hope that you still watch and you still are benefiting from our services. Um, I do miss all of you, and I do pray as I'm looking at this empty place, except 
to Valix. Uh, I do see our people, and I do pray for each one of you. May God bless you. And please keep us in prayer as leaders, as, as pastors of this church. Uh, we need help, and we need all the prayers we can get. Several announcements before we read our passage and pray. I would like to announce, first of all, next Sunday, the 3rd of May, we will have communion service. And the communion service will allow you to also partake of the elements of bread and wine. So we'll have a service at 9 a.m. here in this place. Please don't come. Watch it online. But then at 1 p.m., after the Russian service, at 1 p.m., you're able to come and we will uh, administer, the pastors will administer to you at the elements, bread and wine. You will be able to partake of the communion. Please come if you're able. And uh, again, remember the death of our Savior Jesus Christ and worship together with us at 9 a.m. Again, bring your sanitizer and bring your mask if you want to come. Please let us uh, obey the, the government and the restrictions that they have placed on us. It's an important uh, thing to do in our day. Also, I wanted to uh, talk a little bit about a very important issue among us. Uh, we are in a very difficult time. And as you know, uh, the government restricts our gathering together. We cannot gather, and we don't know how long this is going to last. It seems like the virus is spreading still in Philadelphia, especially in, in nursing homes, and a lot of people are infected. And I don't think the restrictions will be lifted in the next couple of weeks. Uh, it will be longer than that, and uh, even our gatherings will be not will not be able to gather as a church for quite some time. Again, I don't know how long, but but it will not be soon. So I want to challenge you, and I want to remind you the importance of connecting with believers. First of all, I want to recommend you a good book, a great book, one of the best books for Christians, uh, so that we may grow in our. Our godliness in our Christ-likeness. It's called Spiritual Disciplines for the Christian Life. It, this book looks very old. looks like I stole it from a library, uh, which I just bought it used. Um, Spiritual Disciplines for the Christian Life by Donald Whitney. Really good book, and he talks about different means of grace, the practices that we have to incorporate in our lives so that we may derive that grace of God into our souls and be happy in Jesus as well as useful in his kingdom. These disciplines and these practices are super important. This is Christianity 101. Let me just read to you the, the contents of this book. Bible Intake. Number one is to make sure you are in the Word. Then prayer, then worship, evangelism, serving, stewardship, fasting, silence and solitude, journaling, learning, and perseverance in the disciplines. This is a really, really good book, how to grow in godliness, in happiness in Jesus, and being more useful to Him in our daily life. But why am I saying this? I'm saying this because we tend to neglect the gathering of the church together. And let me just read to you several verses from the Bible, um, and you follow along on the screen, on the importance of us connecting spiritually around Jesus. That's a very important uh, means of grace through which we derive grace from God, and we are blessed in our soul. Hebrews 10, 24 and 25. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. So we together, as we gather, as we connect with one another, we are encouraging one another to love and good deeds. Don't forsake it. And this is a command from God. Also, Colossians 3.16 also talks about us coming together and connecting. Let the word of Christ richly dwell with you with all wisdom, teaching, and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. 
This is a worship service. You teach, you admonish one another, you come around God's word, as well as you worship. You, you have the singing and the, the psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, and you do it with thankfulness in your heart to God. We bless one another when we gather as a church. We pursue Christ together. We are encouraging one another in pursuit of Christ, of his uh, person and his work and his holiness. We battle with sin together. We pray for one another. We serve one another. It's all in the, in the context of a community. Christianity is not a lone, lone range uh, religion. We are a body, we are a family, we are a household, we are a building, we are many, and we are making one together in Christ. Let me read to you Apostolic Church, the first church um, in Acts, how they functioned. And I don't think we are there yet. Even, um, even when we were gathering here, I think we're still not there and we should grow in this area. That's why I'm bringing this up. Uh, I see this as a, as a big problem in our church. Acts 2.42, they, the disciples, were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, which is the truth, which is the preaching and teaching of God's word, but also to fellowship. Fellowship means sharing of your life in Jesus or around Jesus. You gather together, not around age, not around uh, special interests, or around a culture, or because we're Slavic people, we gather together. No, we gather, we fellowship, because our commonality is Christ, is Jesus. That's what they did. They fellowshiped. Salvation in Jesus was their commonality, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Verse 43, everyone, just listen, listen how they functioned. What an amazing environment. I hope one day we'll get here to this amazing environment among these people. Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe or amazement. And many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. And all those who had believed were together and had all things in common. And they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all as anyone might have need. Day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house. They were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart. Praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. Jesus Christ, when he enters into our, into our lives, he unites us around himself. Look how much power was among, among these believers in, in that church. How much amazement, as I said, awe. Also sharing of the resources. They were trying to, to meet the physical needs of the believers. Also, we see gladness and joy, happiness in Jesus. Also, we see sincerity of heart. Sincerity of heart, this word means basically humility or simplicity. Being approachable. You're not setting yourself so high that, that nobody can approach and, and, and make you have you as a, as a friend. Friendly, welcoming, easy to be around, approachability. That church was so amazing and they were so together as one. Uh, I hope one day we will become like that. And they gathered to worship God and Jesus Christ and God multiplied them. Maybe God is not sending us baby Christians because we're not ready as a church. We're not ready as a church because we are so apart, so isolated, each one of us. And Christianity that is lived in isolation, it's a bad type of Christianity and leads people into sin. And I want to encourage all of us, brothers and sisters, remember that we, we flourish when we are in community, when we are connected, when we are getting together and we are uh, encouraging one another. I don't want to see anyone being isolated and lonely and fall into depression and sadness and, and, and sin and suicidal thoughts. We were made to be a part of a community. God designed us to be a part of a community. We long to belong. 
It's not good for man and woman to be alone, the Bible says. We are meant to live together, to join in fellowship. So I want you to please reach out. Please benefit from everything that we're doing here. Not only from fellowship at 9 a.m. and our services, but most importantly during the week. Let me, again, this was all introduction to my admonishing and my asking you to please join us. Please, I urge you for the sake of your soul and for the sake of the health and the, and the joy of your soul. Join us. Don't neglect your soul. And people say, well, it's awkward on the camera. So what? So what if it's awkward? It's, it benefits your soul. It's awkward to come here to an empty building, but we do it because it's a good thing and we should pursue it. People say, well, I don't look best on the camera. Well, I'm sorry, but that's the reality where we live in, in which we live. And uh, I think you look fine, <laughs> honestly. Um, and we know how you look in person, so don't worry about that aspect. Join and make sure you turn on the camera, be engaged, and contribute to the Bible study, to the book club, to the fellowship of the youth that we have. So let me announce to you three things that are happening this week. Please join any one of them. First of all, we have college Bible study, 7 p.m. on Wednesday. If you are part of that age group or even a little younger, a little older, that's fine too. Please reach out, reach out to me, reach out to the guys, but please join them. They would love to have you. Also, we have a book club that I lead at 7 p.m. on Thursday. Uh, this is the book that we're going through, Killing Sin Habits, Conquering Sin with Radical Faith. A really good book by Stuart Scott, uh, and we will continue reading it. If you want to join, please reach out to me, and I would love to, join, uh, to have you join us, and you will be blessed in your soul. Also, youth gatherings. Yaroslav, Pastor Yaroslav, started last week, this, come, this past week, on Thursday we had the youth gathering on Zoom. And it was so sad to see so few people join. And I urge you to join us this Friday at 7 p.m. Uh, Yaroslav will lead it again. Also, I just want to let you know that I'm also available. I know that um, I'm not maybe the most approachable person, but I want to give you my phone number. And if you have any prayer requests or anything to talk about, anything under the sun, we can talk about on any topic. And you feel lonely, you feel discouraged, you feel tempted, you feel suicidal. Give me a call 24 7. Mostly 24 7. Available. Please give me a call. My phone number is 610-425-7818. 610-425-7818. Give me a call. We'll talk. We'll fellowship. We'll sing a song. We'll pray. We'll do everything possible to encourage you in your faith. And if you're not a Christian, I'll share the gospel with you. May God bless you. But we really want you to connect with us. It feels like we are preaching and teaching from this end. And it just drops into that black a dark hole, and there is no response. And it's very sad to see that. And we want us to grow spiritually. So may God bless you. I do pray for you. By the way, don't text me. Call me. Um, in our day, we should talk more. Okay, we'll be praying now for this specific need of ours as a church, as a service, as a youth so that we may get closer, that you, we may mortify our sin, our comfort zone, and really be, um, become one, one body serving one another, reproving one another, helping one another to get closer as leaders as well as, as everyone else. And if you're able to give, uh, there's an opportunity for you to worship our God by stewardship, which is one of the means of grace, uh, to give from your resources you're welcome to. Um, our website is lifewaybc.org, lifewaybc.org. You can find the online giving button, click on it, and then it will direct you how to do that. May God bless you with worshiping our God uh, with your finances, if you're able. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for Jesus Christ, for your Son, 
who united us, Lord. It's amazing. The church, the church of Jesus Christ is such an amazing institution that regardless of our age, of culture, of preferences, of anything under the sun, we can be one and so close and so united together in our soul, in the depths of our hearts, because we follow Christ and we love him. That's true fellowship, Lord. Help us, Lord, to not be isolated. Help us, Lord, to not get in our own bubbles, in our own comfort zones, but to be open, to be humble, to be approachable, and to grow together as a, as a church, as service, as leaders, as, as Russian service. Lord, please, Lord, make, us church, make our church more welcoming, more open. Help us, Lord, to mortify our pride, to mortify our comfort zone. Help us, Lord, to be more open and more humble. Lord, and we will enjoy each other, Lord. We will have gladness. We will have amazement in you. We will have the power of the Spirit working in us and among us. We will bless each other. We will be blessed in our soul. And you, Lord, will add baby Christians to us. We want to see babies come and be born here and be baptized here and grow here. But they will never be brought here if we are not fellowshipping, if we are not pursuing unity in Christ. We pray that you'd bless, Lord, everyone who's listening to this service. We pray that you would encourage them, Spirit of God, to join uh, and, and use these means of grace this week and connect and open their hearts and contribute to the conversation, contribute to the prayer and be blessed in their souls. Bless our church, Lord, as we are finding ourselves in a very difficult time. First couple of weeks, it was not as bad, but now it's getting harder and harder. People are get sadder and more depressed and more lonely, more isolated. Many people are suicidal in our day. And we pray, oh God, use us as a church, as a community to connect with them and to invite them to, to fellowship with us so that they may be saved. And we ourselves, Lord, our battle of sin gets, it gets harder because we are more lonely and more isolated. And I pray that you'd help us, Lord, and bless our people. And bless those who are able to give, Lord. We're thankful for jobs that we have. And uh, many of us are, are receiving payments and we are thankful for the provision. Bless our church and bless everyone who is struggling. Help them also to reach out to us as leaders and we are willing, Lord, to, to bless them and to help them. Bless our church, Lord, and bless our people. In Christ's name I pray, amen. King of all creation, set aside his crown. A servant to the Father's love, descended from his throne above. Author of salvation, giver of new life. Crucified to pay for sin, our righteousness is in the name of Jesus.
God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Let us worship and exalt his name forever. Highly exalted is the name of Jesus Christ. Heaven and earth declare all praise to Jesus Christ. Highly exalted is the name of Jesus Christ. your name above all morning church I invite you to open your Bibles with me and we will read this morning from 1 Corinthians chapter 1 starting in verse 18 for the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing but to us who are being saved it is the power of God for it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernments of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not, know, did not know God through wisdom. It pleased God through the folly of what, of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a st stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than man, and the weakness of God is strongest than man. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to the worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth, but God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. And I, 
when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with the lofty speech or wisdom. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. And my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of man, but in the power of God. The title of this message is The Power of God in Message of the Cross. The whole humanity is going through a period of feeling quite powerless or defenseless right now. The man who travels into the outer space creates machines capable of performing billions of calculations per second. The man who detects subatomic particles suddenly finds himself at the mercy of a tiny cluster of protein surrounding some genetic material. And people are asking, where is God? Can he do something about this? Bible affirms the goodness of God to us, as you heard in the previous messages. But today, I want to focus on the power of God displayed in a very unexpected symbol and event, the cross of Christ. When Paul wrote a very tough letter to Corinthian church, he started with the message of the cross. We just read in chapter 2, verse 2, Paul emphatically writes, For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. In a passage we just read this morning, Paul is making three points. And now I would like to share those points with you. Point number one. The word of the cross divides. Let us look at the text again. The word of the cross is it is something. Many people today are indifferent to the cross. They say that the cross is irrelevant to them. It doesn't speak to issues we, modern people, wrestle with. First of all, let us establish what Paul is referring to in saying the word of the cross. He is referring to the message about Christ crucified on the cross for the sins of the world. In other world, words, Paul is referring to the gospel with the cross of Christ at the very center of it. Paul is saying that this gospel message about the cross of Christ represents to people one of two things. To those who are perishing, going to hell, so to speak, the message is about the, the message about the cross of Christ is foolishness. And Paul is not mincing words here. The word Maria used here gave us the English word moron. So, for those who are perishing, the message about the cross of Christ is anti-intellectual and irrational. For another group of people, those who are being saved, the message about the cross of Christ is the power of God. 
And you might ask, how is the power of God displayed in a crucifixion of an innocent man? Indeed, Jesus was the innocent man who was put to death unjustly. But he was also God who came down to people with the mission of reconciling humanity to himself. Why? Because we people are unable to reconcile ourselves to God. We are totally uh, depraved of any power within us to save ourselves. Only the power outside of us, the dunamis, Greek word used here, the power of God which was the most magnificently displayed in the cross of Christ could accomplish this. Please note the present tense in the text. We who are being saved. Cross is not the place where the sinner dumps his sin and walks away. The whole life of a believer is found in the shadow of the cross of Christ. That is why the word of the cross divides people. Either it is utter stupidity or it is the power of God. No middle ground here. And Paul's first point is very insightful. History of the church provides us with many examples of attempts to find the middle ground. Many so-called Christians try to improve the message of the cross, make it more palatable and sophisticated for the world. The end of 19th century saw such an attempt to modernize the message of the cross. The modernist preachers announced that the essence of Christianity is the universal brotherhood of man under the universal fatherhood of God. Human depravity was redefined to describe social evil which oppresses the good humanity. The suffering of Christ wasn't described as imputation of man's sin to Christ and of Christ's righteousness to man, but but described as an example of selfless life. Today, smiling preachers draw crowds of followers with this improved gospel. This improved gospel offers Spirituality without religion. Satisfaction in life without commitment. Christ without the cross. In 1993, the conference of feminist theologians called Reimagining took place in the city of Minneapolis. One of the speakers, Dr. Dr. Dolores Williams said the following, We don't need blood dripping from crosses. In other words, she said that the message of the cross has no place in Christianity. The modern world doesn't want the message of the cross. Yet it is a part of our common history. In ancient Roman Empire, crucifixion was a form of execution reserved for the enemies of the empire. As Rome was conquering the world, those who dared to protest its rule were executed in a public and brutal way. Crosses were placed along well-traveled roads. The plaque that explained the charges was placed above the head of every executed person as a powerful warning to others not to oppose the Roman power. The executed person 
did not die instantly, suffering for many hours in excruciating pain. People witnessed this gruesome reality but couldn't help the dying person. After many hours of agony, the crucified person suffocated, not able to take another breath. It was the ultimate display of defeat. Condemned to die, the person was losing the will to take another breath and prolong this agony until defeated and exhausted he ceased to breathe. That is how death on the cross was described in historical accounts. And while this history is undeniable, the message of the cross, this world is not willing to accept. So this is the first truth. The word of the cross divides. The second point Paul is making here, the word of the cross teaches. A lot of people excuse themselves from accepting the gospel by claiming that they cannot understand it. I happen to believe that the message of the gospel is simple and clear so even a child can understand it. I also believe that people claim that they cannot understand the gospel because they are not willing to surrender a deeply held conviction that a man can redeem himself. Most people believe in God. Most people believe in sin. Most people believe in some form of judgment, but they cannot accept God's grace. They want to be able to do something to justify themselves before God. And as long as they hold on to, this, to their wisdom, their abilities and merits, the message of the cross doesn't make sense to them. If you find yourself in this category, let me focus your attention on seven verses in Romans 3, which declare seven truths about God's grace. We'll read these seven verses, starting in verse 19 of chapter 3. Now we know that whatever the law says... It speaks to those who are under the law. So that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness, because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. I just want to list those seven truths about the grace of God. No one is declared righteous before God by observing the law. That's the first truth. 
Secondly, there is a righteousness from God that is apart from the law. Thirdly, the righteousness from God is received through faith in Jesus Christ. Fourth, this righteousness is available, available to everyone on the same basis because all have sinned and have fallen short of the glory of God. Five, all who put their faith in Jesus Christ are justified freely by God's grace. The justification is through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. And finally, God presented Jesus as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. Now, if you trust this truth, you will have faith to surrender your life to the grace of God. And the cross of Christ will make total sense to you. Remember, you cannot justify yourself on your own terms. You can only be justified on God's terms through the cross of Christ. Therefore, Paul is asking here in our text, where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? It is not surprising that those who live by secular reason don't show up at church. People don't come to Christ because they are smart, but because the power of God is at work. The power of God is at work in preaching of the gospel. We read that God delights in saving those who believe in the folly of the message of the cross. For Jews who ask for signs demonstrating the power of Christ, crucified Christ is scandal. For Greeks who do not even ask but pursue wisdom themselves, crucified Christ is a folly. But for those who are called Jews and Greeks, crucified Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. The message of the cross teaches that we come to Christ not because we are smart, but because of God's power. The message of the cross teaches us that we are saved because we have been called, not because we are wise, powerful, or noble. Quite the opposite. The cross of Christ humiliates the wise, the powerful, the noble, because Christ became our wisdom, righteousness, and sanctification. Brothers and sisters, let us remember what the message of the cross teaches us. We're saved not because of our merits. We're saved through Christ crucified. That is the power of God and wisdom of God. We are saved not to boast in our achievements, but to boast in the Lord. The third point Apostle Paul is making here in this text. I mentioned that the word of the cross divides. Secondly, the word of the cross teaches. And now, finally, the word of the cross challenges. The best learners are those who practice what they have learned. We should not only believe in the power of God in the message of the cross, we should experience that power. The message of the cross challenges us to make a commitment to testifying the crucified Christ. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. 
Some suggest that Paul decided to be ignorant about anything else but crucified Christ. The rest of the book refutes such suggestion since Paul provides profound teaching about conflict resolution, church discipline, marriage, spiritual gifts, Lord's Supper, and future resurrection. However, Paul's main subject is crucified Christ. His eyes are focused on Christ. His ministry is all about Christ. So the cross of Christ challenges us to ask ourselves a question. What does my life preach? What do my actions proclaim? What uh, am I eager to learn and know the most in this life? I hope that the answer is Christ. If there is power of God in the message of the cross, then you will use it to overcome sin in your life. If there is power of God in the message of the cross, then you will use it to save others from sin. If there is power in the message of the cross, then you will never be ashamed to declare declare the cross of Christ. If there is power of God in the message of the cross, then you will never forsake it for your career, your income, or your pleasure. If there is power of God in the message of the cross, then you will never forget what the purpose of your life is. You and I might never be powerful preachers in speech. Yet the message of the cross should display the power of God in our lives. To this end, let us remember on each side, on which side of the divide we stand today. And what the word of cross teaches us today. When it comes to the game of American football, I do not know much, but I know about Vince Lombardi, one of the greatest coaches in American football. When his team, Green Bay Packers, suffered a humiliating defeat from New York Giants, he came to a team practice picked up a football and famously said, Gentlemen, this is football. Let me teach you the game of football. In the same way, let me say today to all of us, this is the message of the cross, the gospel. Let it teach us about the power of God. Amen. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your power by which you created heavens and earth, every living thing and all that surrounds us. We thank you that by your power you sustain life on this earth, you sustain the whole universe. We thank you that by your power you established an everlasting covenant with your creation by which you send your own son to this earth to become man and die for the sins of the world. And now... We proclaim the power, your power, in a cross of Christ. Father, we thank you that we, sinful people, 
who are unable to save ourselves, to redeem ourselves before you, are redeemed by the power of the cross. We thank you that today that power is available through the message of the gospel to all who believe in that message. Today, the saving power of the cross of Christ is powerful to save many, many lives from eternal damnation. Now, Father, we ask you that you would teach us from this word of the cross to trust you more and rely on your power, not ours. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. My worth is not in what I own, not in the strength of flesh and bone. But in the costly wounds of love at the cross My worth is not in skill or name In win or lose, in pride or shame But in the blood of Christ that flows We fade and die Fame, youth and beauty hurry by But life eternal calls to us At the cross I will not boast in wealth or might Or human wisdom's in knowing Christ at the cross I rejoice in my Redeemer greatest treasure wellspring of my soul I will trust in Him no other my soul is satisfied in Him my ransom pay at the cross I rejoice in my Redeemer greatest treasure wellspring of my soul I will trust in Him no other my soul is satisfied in Him alone I rejoice in my Redeemer, greatest treasure, wellspring of my soul. I will trust in Him, no other, my soul is satisfied in Him alone.